that's the cruelty of Red Dwarf, really, was there's that real proper, like, oh, f you know, regret. Why? Why did I do that? And I feel really stressed and I'm really hot and I'm really uncomfortable and I just want to go home and I don't want to do this and I want to be in my garden. You know, any, any excuse. And then you do it and the audience love it and you go, damn, that was fun. I enjoyed that. It was oh, that's brilliant. Absolutely fantastic. Absolutely fabulous brilliant. to have yeah. them back. Well, the scripts were funny and that is the hallmark of any Red Dwarf. You read it through for the first time and we're all laughing. That was amazing. <laughs> that was proper, real Red Bull. This series ranks alongside four, five and six, you know. We were in some holes. We were in holes that, you know, you could quite easily have had the walls cave in. So it was a very difficult <laughs> ride. You may have heard the knee trembling news. I wonder who from, Robert. <laughs> that was top secret. That I told you in confidence. That Robert blocked. I have this very specific and and vivid memory of coming into the production office uh, after the Back to Earth broadcast over the bank holiday weekend and Doug came in and sat down and said, so I'm starting to think about, you know, maybe the next series. And I said, oh, great. So, you know, trying to capture the thing that you've been doing, the red cameras, this kind of dynamic visual direction. You went, nah, multi-camera, studio audience. Back to Earth I wanted to do in front of a studio audience. I've always wanted to do Red Wolf in front of a studio audience. In many ways, it's harder to shoot. We're trying to get back to um, a series on Red Wolf with the four principles. I'm really trying to get an audience. Uh, <laughs> After we did Back to Earth, all the discussions that we had were very much to, really focused on audience. That was, the, that was the most commonly used word when we discussed the possibility of doing more Red Dwarf. Whether it's because Charles didn't actually want the audience, UK TV weren't crazy about the idea of the audience either because they said they wanted the big look of Back to Earth. But I was really, really clear right from the start, I wanted an audience, I knew the guys wanted an audience, and more importantly, I knew the fans wanted an audience. But it has to be said, not everyone cared as much as I did whether we had an audience or not, and perhaps as a consequence of that, the cost of the audience wasn't included in the budget that was agreed with UK TV and BBC Worldwide. And this meant, because the budget was fixed, uh, if we wanted an audience, we had to pay for it ourselves. <laughs> <laughs> he wanted to shoot it very much like we'd shot Back to Earth, the film, um, and he wanted to shoot it in front of an audience, uh, multi-camera. Uh, there's a very tall order. But Doug uh, placated me by saying, don't worry, it'll just be four guys sitting around a table. The most that'll ever happen is one will get up and go to the door or one will come from the door. And the very first script that showed up began, the crew get a signal, they head out on Starbug, they land on a planet where a furious storm is brewing, lightning everywhere, and it's going to destroy anything that's on the planet in a matter of moments. And they get on board the Trojan, this huge, super brilliant vessel, and then they lift it off and take it back to Red Dwarf along with Starbug. This is your idea of small? <laughs> Michael Ralph is an amazing designer, and what he came up with for that set is brilliant. I really always enjoyed the exterior of the ship, and this is something that stayed with me for years, where every time we did a pass on the exterior of the Red Dwarf, I found that to be the most interesting part of the look of the show, and trying to introduce that into the interior. And that's a bold move, if you like, because how do you do something as radical as changing the colour of the interior or changing it so strongly that people then don't feel like it is familiar or feel like it isn't their old show, so to speak? As soon as I walked into the um, sleeping quarters, I went, oh, my God. D it outside became inside. It's really the detail in that set, that you could actually stand in it and look at a bit of wall that wide, rather, and there was so much... Detail. Lots of uh, IKEA cutlery trays. Cutlery trays, lifesaver. Spaceships can be built from IKEA. Michael's also into building in lighting where he can into the sets. 
It's got a lot of light panels. He uses a lot of LED lighting. It gives them a nice sort of 3D quality. It gives them a depth and a feeling that the set is actually something that really does work and it's something that people would live in and a part of a working spacecraft. The sets are fantastic. The drive room set. I mean, it's just the depth of it all and the colours and the screens and the lights. I wanted to feel like it was the nose cone of a ship, even though it wasn't. I wanted to feel like it had a pointy end. I wanted to feel like it had some sense of direction. I wanted to feel like it had some sense of control. How much time is this going to save me, Bob? Well, Jane, the average person who lives into their 90s and has six cups of coffee a day spends over two weeks stirring drinks. Oh, my! Two weeks. Corridor sets, the, the ingenuity of the kind of mechanics of it really fascinated me that, you, you know, you could flip walls around and they'd be the wall of another ship or you could flip it into a different position. I mean, really, I mean, and incredibly simple, not kind of complicated and... You know, the, when you looked at it and understood what it was made of, you go, wow, that is just, ge that's a stroke of genius. I wanted to create a corridor that was interchangeable and would become other shapes, if necessary. And, yeah, this is going to sound weird, but I've always thought that someone should use shopping trolleys for more than what they're used for. So what I decided to do was design a set that I could build on the top of shopping trolleys. I put them on two trolleys because they were still multi-directional. You can drag them around. It became something that was very successful. Plus, the back of the corridor itself, we turned into the Trojan corridor, so you could dress both sides. You're perfectly safe, sir. Have no fear. We almost know what we're doing. Very. <laughs> so how long have I been out? He <laughs> <laughs> really does need a bloody There's the lift. now. <laughs> <laughs> Now, we had been given a budget for development, and reading that, that contract, it says, actually, pay the writer to write the scripts. That didn't happen until much later. What did happen now was a location manager was um, employed to go off and find locations based on nothing I'd written, but to plant ideas in my head about possible locations I could write in. And I was sent various photographs of these locations we could shoot at. And then when I said, so what about the scripts. I was told by Charles not to write the scripts until we got the cast on board. As it was possible, um, if we couldn't sign one of the guys, the series wouldn't happen. We finally signed the last member of cast, I think in September 2011, and we went into pre-production in October. We look at the schedule, and I go, I'm not comfortable with the schedule, and was told the whole thing could slide six weeks. So it was like, oh, okay, fine. If the whole thing can slide six weeks, that's scary still, but I'm much more comfortable with that. Months later, we signed up Craig. And a family pen. I then hear that Craig has got to be back in Corrie on February the 13th. And then I go, so how can we have this six-week slide? And discover we now have lost the six-week slide. We can't have it. It's properly terrifying. It's probably terrifying when you're just the writer. But when you're the writer and the director, where well, you literally can't be at home writing and directing. It puts pressure on every single person involved in it because they're operating at least two to three months behind. And that includes the writing, presumably? It includes everything. And Charles basically said, you've got a choice. You either do the series or you don't. And so you need to go off and have a think about that. We can do this! He's right. Let's do it. Let's do it. Come on. Come on. Get your butts in the air and let's go. It's like the first episode, literally. It's like, you know, we're going back into it like it's a, it's a new baby. Mm. And it's got that sort of same kind of, oh, my God. Did you see the quality of that hair? That's Pooh's, that one. Ooh, actually, that's and Action that's Man. This that is... Machine. Yes, yes, that's yeah. Pamela yeah. Anderson. <laughs> Look at you. He looks young again. You know what's going on? Mean and lean. You look about ten years younger. You do. You do. What's going on? You should come on like that first show. Oh, we've got to. With the, with the, with the walking frames and the whole thing. I like the yeah. full zoom. Yeah. In yeah, which, yeah, yeah. Which is huge. Yeah. That's <laughs> that should be the first game. Yeah, that would be great. And then. You know, you can't remember because you've got to go to the low, yeah. toilet breaks, all that. All of that. Yeah. We should all, when the audience is in, we should all come out like that. Yeah, that should be the one. Let's go out with Craig in a wheelchair. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. 
That's the biggest gag in it. That, that is the <laughs> smeg out. <laughs> Yeah. I just wipe the dribble off it. I'm sure Dougie, let's go! I'm sure Dougie, I can still do it, yeah. <laughs> I still do all my own stunts. Yeah. yeah, I've been listening to him in Christopher Hitchens as well. Right. Yeah. We're doing a, a religion one, um, so it's been very interesting. Are we doing a religious episode? Oh, brilliant. Yeah. Oh, good. It's a Jesus oh. And they said, Rob, we've got a new budget. A few things have had to go. You've got an audience. Terrific. You've lost two weeks of OB filming. They have to go. Now, having been fed a location manager who found locations, locations are littered through the series. You can't film Red Dwarf just in one building. Um, and it was like, no, no, we really, that's it, just the building. So that, that was like an interesting challenge because that really then affected everything. And a lot of things went by the wayside, which is a real shame, um, but that happens. Scripts were falling apart, the ones that were already in, because we don't have a quarry. You've got to fix that. We don't have a circus. We're not going to be able to shoot it to circus. And so that whole second half now dissolves. I do remember saying to Robert and Chris, we were freezing our nuts off in the back lot in the sparse wood at Shepperton, and I was looking down with the leather boots and the leather trousers and the leather jacket full of graffiti and studs and badges and all that, and I think the locks this time look better than they've ever done before. He's got a good look on him at the moment, Mister. But I just turned around and said, "Look, this is no way for a man who's hurtling towards his fifties to be dressed." <laughs> Lister, we've kept the the leathers look, and I actually got a graffiti artist to customise his his jacket. We've added more badges onto here, but it's very much, you know, we've taken the art student sort of feel to it and it's really sort of broken down and crusty. The costume of this series feels pretty similar. I mean, the things that have improved, it's all those weird little bits that Howard has worked out. You know, those sort of leg bits that clip together. And definitely in the last series, if I moved my leg in the wrong way, they'd all go ping and the thing would fall off, or they'd slip down, or the shin bit would come undone. Or the... And so all those little refinements mean that once it's on, it stays on. He's still wearing the same boots of 23 years ago, the Crichton that first had, because they came from a shop in the King's Road. <laughs> they were so perfect, I've never found another pair that match. So when they actually fall apart, I don't know what we're going to do. He'll go barefoot. And the look has been so refined now that we act, we're actually like four cartoon characters. We pulled out all the stops. <laughs> ah. But only the cat can carry it off. Howard, he, he knows the character, he knows what he can get away with, and he keeps pushing the boundaries. And that's what you need with him. Because if I walked out any week and people didn't go, oh my God, what is he doing? got on there, it just wouldn't be cat. And that is a lot of pressure to, for a designer to keep coming up with designs that people are not gonna be bored with, you know, after 25 years. But we've really gone for color and a different look for each episode. Usually with a red dwarf costume, I'm kind of slightly worried about, you know, the robustness where we had maybe one button problem early on. But apart from that, that costume was, uh, if it could be 11 out of 10, I'd give it. We went to the tailors and we had this much more sort of streamlined tunic that just keeps him rather taut and pent up. And we got lovely win in the art department to change his badge. We've gone to a, a silver colour. I think you should just bleed it out. I think you're <laughs> Shut up. In the comedic content, I thought it was a very, very funny show. Uh, there were self-contained episodes as well, so you didn't have to watch episode one to know what was going on in episode two. If you go back to the fundamentals of the show, the fundamentals of the characters will come out, and I think that's what the, the audience wanted, and which made them laugh. There was a sort of 
a, a stronger element of a group of people that were destined to be together rather than forced together. There was some subtle change. They've all accepted each other and their roles, the characters have, in a way that, that was very subtly different. So there's still lots of, of, of cruel gags between them all. We're using epic cameras and we're using prime lenses and zoom lenses. And normally you wouldn't have focus pullers. You'd just have operators and you'd have sort of broadcast cameras that would go into a truck and it'll be vision mixed. But we've made our life slightly harder by using proper cameras. Um, but in essence, what we've done is we've gained in production value. A lot of people said at, at the beginning of this, we are absolutely bleep mad shooting a, essentially what is a sitcom in a film way. So the, the thing became a hybrid. On the rehearsal day, once we've blocked the scenes through between Andy, Doug and myself, we decide where all four cameras are going to go on the night. Uh, I make a diagram uh, plotting where all the cameras are going to be and the different types of shots they're going to get on which characters so that when the extra cameramen come in on the Friday plus the boom swingers, the grips, anyone who wasn't there in rehearsal, they can see what we're doing on each set as we move to it. Standard operating is camera one moves on a track out the front, cameras three and four will pick up characters, singles, on the left-hand side of the set, and camera two will always pick up singles or two shots on the right-hand side of the set. Yeah, yeah. OK. Stand by. We're shooting on the Red Epic. Um, it's a very new camera. It's a 5,000-line HD camera. It's the highest-resolution camera there is out there. Red's up. Nice and quiet, please. <laughs> 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 I mean, it's a long time since we did Red Dwarf and Rotten Audience, so the, it was all a good idea until they put the seats out. And I, my memory was of doing it in front of an audience and hearing the audience laughing and getting the laughs in the right place and working with the audience and all that. That was all good. And then when they put the seats out in the studio when we were rehearsing, I went, hmm, don't, don't want all those people coming to watch. It is daunting to, you know, you haven't done it for, what is it, 12, 15 years. It puts a lot of pressure on us to have the audience because it means you have some to have something to show to an audience and it also means you need to shoot chronologically which is something Doug's been very insistent on and that's not just out of order in terms of having the stuff that we don't shoot in front of them to play in it's also being able to run the scenes in order which might room mean jumping between the drive room and the sleeping quarters the corridor whereas normally you might shoot all the scenes in the drive room all the scenes in the sleeping quarters all the scenes in the corridors and the pressure of the first recording in front of the audience was close to, you know, the most frightened I've ever been performing. Utter sheer terror. Playing Crichton, please welcome Robert Llewellyn! <laughs> going out in front of the audience and bowing, and they are a fantastic audience, and then going into the set and going, I don't know, I don't know what we're doing. You know, I couldn't remember nothing. Like, is there, do I have the first line? What is it? I haven't got a clue, you know, so that kind of terror blankness w was pretty scary. I found it less nerve-wracking now than, than, I, than I ever did before. Because um, I think the four of us are all kind of natural show-offs, really, and um, especially Robert, you know, put Robert in the mask, and he, he spends the whole three and a half hours of the shoot in front of the audience in character, you know? So he's running around showing off, being Crichton, and me and Chris are busy trying to, like, uh, nail the scene. <laughs> I saw you panicking on Twitter last night. Yes, sir. About your line learning. Lines. Have you let them all? No. <laughs> There's quite a few more to go. <laughs> We're doing a lot in there. That'll be fun. <laughs> Get comfy. <laughs> when we're gathering in the corridor, about to be introduced, there's lots of pacing going on, lots of sort of, you know, deep breathing, everyone dealing with the idea of going in front of the fans. And it's become more and more important, really, that, you know, more and more at stake, I guess. For the fans, we want the show to be as good as possible, particularly it's the first show of the first series and it's first time before doing a, a Red Dwarf audience show since 1998, late 98, I think. <laughs> Very much a nervy kind of feeling. But that's an exciting feeling. There's nothing like coming onto a stage to a round of applause. <laughs> once we got that down, once that first recording was done, I think the morale for all of us lifted. It was almost a sort of dream Red Dwarf 
episode for the Rimmer character so early on. You know, I just wasn't expecting it immediately to meet one of these legendary brothers. Extraordinary! Did the Rock do this? Ship's hologram Captain Howard Rimmer. Do you copy? Over. Rimmer's brother. There's gonna be an earthquake of a gag and they didn't have to wait long. But you were an utter twat! <laughs> Mark Dexter was just fantastic. Because when I first saw him, I thought, oh, I don't know if he looks like Chris, as soon as he spoke. <laughs> it just was magnificent, and he, he just was the annoying other brother. The Rimmer boys are quite similar in many ways. Um, there's a family resemblance, uh, there's an H on the forehead, and there's a chip on the shoulder. For any man to get, I don't know how many syllables he got into twat, but um, it was there were quite a few. What an act! I mean, you you really did feel as though you were dealing with some guy from the RAF in the 1950s. You know, this lovely clipped manner to him. I was the sort of template, if you like, that he had to work with. You could spot those little rimmery family traits in there. Chris's performance, I think, is part of British culture. It's one of those performances that you just remember. It's a character that you just kind of know. Nice ship. A quantum twister listy. I drop the colour completely out of it. If you watch it, you'll see that it's mostly greys, dark greys. I didn't want it to have the life that the dwarf had. It was opposite, a juxtaposition of look to dwarf. And it triggered everything you've ever seen before, Star Trek Forbidden Planet. It had clean lines, it had the obvious qualities that, that sci-fis have always had from the beginning of time, which is, you know, transporters, a large drive chair in the middle of the room on a tiered level. The transporters themselves couldn't be fabricated. That's something you couldn't afford to build. So I designed them, but I designed them after I, what I already found was a bathroom shower unit that would do the job. It had the glass and we could open the doors and they were double openers so you could do them with wires at the back so they looked hydraulic. And we were able to put together the transporters with shower units, you know, good sized shower units. Everything is found objects. The chair in the middle of the tiered section is a chair from uh, a truck. The big base that that chair is on, that big hexagon, is actually originally from the special Red Dwarf, which it was in the roof above the central table in the sleeping quarters. Well, actually, hundred and second. Yeah. In an ideal world, it would be this chair. Yeah. So, is that chair glued to that stand? Yeah, it's fixed. It's fixed, and not the moment. But it, because it's all underlit up there, it's the uh, jewel in the crown. Well, the sinking chair moment, we tried on various different real chairs to engineer it so that it went down at the right speed and at the right time. But of course, it either sort of uh, had me sort of going, you know, like that, or it kind of had me going, I'm supposed to go now. I'm not going now, I've gone, you know, that sort of stuff. So, in the end, we just thought this is going to be much easier if I do it myself. So, using my uh, football-enhanced thighs, I basically did some sort of squats every now and then. That's so much better, that's great. And remember the line, that was the big challenge. Raj Columbus 3, this is former First Tech exec... Oh, shit. <laughs> Crawford spies three memory sticks in a drive. She inserts one after another into the next ball and uploads them instantly. She throws them away. Now for the rod. She's got a great rabbit face, Susan Earl. Difficult part to play that, really, you know, you don't know if you want to go robotic with it. It's really hard to play a robot. I had no idea when I used to watch all the sci-fi stuff. But actually playing a robot's really hard, because you kind of can't act. You've got to do a kind of non-acting thing. Okay. I hadn't really thought about what the hollow spasm would be, so sort of when it, when it sort of went like that, I thought, well, actually, these guys are going to have to do the same. <laughs> you realise that you know you can pull these comedy faces, but you only usually hold them for a second or two, and that one I had to hold for ages. <laughs> Fun dressing up for Star Trek. It did give it did give you the feeling like, geez, those suits are unforgiving. You know, I mean, it's a good job that we're all we're all in fairly good shape for our ages, really. Um, because if we weren't, you'd soon know about it wearing them suits. You know, the line in the script was the uh, 
the tight-fitting Lycra suits, so I've taken that literally. But it, I did it so that it would light brilliantly, but they were all very streamlined. The word snug is definitely appropriate. Very hard to go to the toilet. <laughs> we did give her a rather um, tight-fitting black PVC corset that accentuated her assets, as it were. The idea was that it was parked in Red Dwarf's cargo bay. So when Rimmer's brother gets teleported on board, he, we, we want him to think we're in deep space. But if he looks out the window, he'd see the Red Dwarf cargo bay. So the idea was that we would be running up and down outside with black bits of wood with stars on them, holding them up at the window. So if he looked out the window, he'd see that. It was the first thing we rehearsed in, in series 10, because we went outside to the corridor by the offices and the prod production hub and everything. And um, we did this little sequence. Come to you, sir. Come to you, sir. Come to you, sir. You know, to attempt that, it's one of those things that you start filming, it could take five hours. The amount of time you'd have had to spend not only rehearsing it, plotting it, filming it. I think Doug thought, look, why don't I just write a different scene? We kind of had a conversation that started with, well, OK, but if they are pretending to be this other crew, what, what would be the problems? What would be the thing? And I, I said something along the lines of, oh, well, then you wouldn't call Cat Cat, you'd call him Gerald Hampton or something. And all of a sudden, Doug spun this off into, oh, well, all the characters have that, and it's Crichton Kryzinski and all of that. Uh, and then he reaches almost immediately afterwards, oh, and it could be like, He's wearing the uniform of a telepath or something, and the guy says, oh, so you're a telepath, prove it. I thought the touch tea thing was funny. And his face, when I'm squeezing his head, when he goes, that's exactly what I was thinking. <laughs> and I was really squeezing his head, and I kept saying, I'm not hitting you, I'm not hitting you. He's going, no, 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 but his eyes were watering. <laughs> this thing where they were pretending for longer, for harder, just seemed so much more rewarding. I'm going for the phone. All right, you win. Yeah, I mean, it's fun, all that sort of, you know, action stuff, running around, running down corridors, firing guns. Yes, I had to be told not to kind of go pew, pew, when I was shooting the gun. We've all done that, though. I've done that. Locked and loaded, you know. It's very difficult not to. As you can see, all the B team are in at the moment. I'm just sort of standing by. Offset, ready to come in and steal the scene, basically. And if I have to die so that no other life form has to go through this maze of hell, then so be it. I am going for the phone. <laughs> This week's show was a very heavy one for Craig. He gave an enormous amount of lines to them, and he was sick. He had two days off this week, and he still remembered all his lines, and I think it's worth saying. <laughs> I've got ill on the end of episode one. I think you can hear a bit in the voice in some of the scenes. Yeah, I got the flu. Two doctors came to see me and said, like, you know... Uh, they just put me on a major course of antibiotics. He was really poorly on the Friday night and got through it on the audience night. And the next week, you know, and I think he just spent the whole weekend in bed. <laughs> Poor guy. Because I took a script to his hotel to give, to give to him and see if he was all right. And he was... I've never seen him that. He was really under the weather, poor thing. I caught a cold for about two days, but luckily it was early on in, in the week, so I could get over it. <laughs> so cold in here. I've got to wear two caps. This is the barn. I think that was what was getting it, because even Doug came down with a bug at one point. I've had so much coding today to go with my chest. I'm like this, I have ground for So anyway, enough of me. Uh, I'll hand you back to Tom, and then you can introduce you to the cast. I don't know if Tom's gone. Uh, I don't Yeah. Let's go. Let's go. 
off the gut, friend. It was really good. I want some of that stuff. When I thought about putting myself in his shoes for that week and thinking that you're bed-bound with flu, the last thing you're thinking is, I'm going to be in front of an audience on Friday night doing a show. Of all the episodes uh, that you don't want your leading man to be down with flu and unavailable is for to be the episode where he plays entire scenes with himself. And maybe that's why you've ended up like this. Like what? You're a big disappointment to me, David. You really are. <laughs> <laughs> The biggest problem it caused was losing the rehearsal time. I mean, we lost shoot time with him as well, but actually losing the rehearsal time was more key because it meant when we did have him to shoot with, A, he wasn't feeling 100% anyway because he came back as soon as he could rather than when he was completely over it, and B, he hadn't rehearsed the stuff that we were wanting to do with him and nobody else had either. I came back on the Wednesday and uh, straight into filming. I was filming my, myself being my dad, so I was being trashed anyway. Not much acting in that. <laughs> he did that one very well, because <laughs> he looked rough as guts. <laughs> I had to uh, down all these uh, whiskies, which you, you'd be surprised to find out what weren't actually whiskey, but were, were apple juice. I think I must have drank two litres of apple juice. And it was just like, you know, when you're not well, you've got all this acid in your stomach, it was like, oh, it was a nightmare. And he comes back and delivers what he did deliver on the... that week. When you watch this, you'll feel like you've got a totally normal, ordinary, regular dad. Yeah? <laughs> I don't remember making this. Hands up, you know, top, top performance and, you know, one of my mem big memories of, of Red Dwarf 10. Previous conversation, saying you were looking forward to the previous conversation and now feel a bit lost not having had that conversation. But you conclude you will probably get used to hearing the results of your conversations and no longer having the conversations yourselves. Cut. Fantastic. Cut. Rebecca, very striking image and, you know, delivered the lines like a machine gun. And didn't she do them well, these long, complicated lines and, and the speed at which she did them? And boom, 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 boom. Absolutely awesome. Absolutely awesome piece of casting. Bris brilliant and apparently someone said she was nervous um, but I had no sense of that um, she was just so so <laughs> brilliant I was so intimidated when I first walked in to the room and was introduced to everyone and I thought oh, no. but everyone was so friendly and nice and they are just a joy to work with. Disposed of itself by flying straight into the nearest cell. That's fantastic! I had no sense of what I was doing. And then I was sitting in the makeup chair and I had just got my makeup on and I thought, I'm gonna try some of these lines out. And I was looking in the mirror and suddenly I had bigger lips and really dark eyes and it just kind of, I felt, you know, Darker within. Exactly right, Crichton. And what about the engineer? I bollocked up now as well. <laughs> Everyone was so damn good that I was. Only the three worst lines in the history. I think the exactly. bollock had been pre dropped sir. <laughs> <laughs> We have to share it between us and we all drop it. <laughs> Can you hurry up? It's really hot up here. <laughs> well, I was stuck up there next to this red hot light and they're just faffing about and getting it wrong, like, in the end. I said, like, I'm up here, you know, <laughs> like, you know, help me out. I was, um, I was baking up there. Looking forward to the previous conversation and now feel a bit lost not having had that conversation. <laughs> you will probably get used to hearing the results of your conversations and no longer having the conversations yourselves. Hey, new computer! The idea came about because they wanted a small forklift that would go down the corridors and was a working machine. Is Erica the one mean machine? I wanted to give it 
softer lines. So I put the hoses on the top that linked around the back, the like hydraulic hoses. Now as soon as I put those on, he started calling it Erica. And all of a sudden there was some sort of mad attraction that uh, Graham had for this, this uh, mobility scooter. As you can see, she's quite a sexy thing. Originally she was called Eric, but as we started making it, it was quite obvious it was a she rather than a he. It became Erica, and then everyone got to know her as Erica uh, instead of a Drone 3, which is originally what she was. Doors open both sides, so you can get in, so you can gain access either side. Batteries charge from the back. Let's see. Um, and away she goes. And in the end, you could see bright as day sitting inside that thing. Left. 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 Well, I believe I was led astray, really, by, by a compatriot who was supposed to be guiding me left and right but forgot that my left was his right and his right was my left. Shouted left and we crushed her. Nothing we couldn't repair. I think it was the reputations that were in tatters. Do you want to go again on that? Yes, yeah. please. Um, OK, and then the door opens. Uh, and behind it is green screen. Yeah. yeah. Now! And then brakes on the window here. Right. Going, hey, help, 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 let me out, let me out. Chat, 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 chat. Right. Intercut inside with ex whatever, right. extinguish. Mm -hmm. And then in an ideal world, you would then just go. Yeah. Yeah. So it's like banging on the window. <laughs> and then the, the airlock door opens at the back. I'm giving it help, help, help. And it's and I get kicked off the ship through an airlock, and we were going to fly that originally. I was going to do that on wires against the green screen, but the way it was done in the end worked really quite well. Uh, we saw the camera on a track which shot away from me, and I was on a green chair, and so just sort of like that on a green chair, giving it all of that. And when it's all kind of reversed, it kind of it, it looks really realistic. <laughs> Turn over. We will be firing on this take. Stand by and action. B deck, the floor's been repaired. Bree, what happened? I thought you were going to repair all this. I did. It's one botch up after another. I've found that a bit difficult because I didn't quite know how to pitch it because I, I wanted to maintain the speed of the line so to be true to kind of what I had done in, in when I was shooting separately but at the same time you have to be heard so you kind of lose a bit of the character but you want to feed as much of the character as possible as well so I found that really difficult and then all the banging yeah it was really intimidating and so you're trying to go you know do something really quite intimate and that but yelling over bangs and pyrotechnics and uninstall you now if your primary function is to save crew members time and energy shouldn't you just uninstall yourself now it was a difficult scene to film that this is the truck attack that we haven't rehearsed at all because craig's not been here so then it was okay doug so how what are we doing here and it was literally made up in five minutes that whole truck thing i mean i knew it was truck attack and it's not like I hadn't thought about it but it was oh. we could sense when we we're all being squashed by the truck we could sense that it wasn't quite working because there wasn't any pressure so we were doing sort of cod I'm being crushed acting to make matters worse we've only got one truck they've got a panel that's like the front of it but it can only work by people holding it and walking around with it you think well, I'm not going to squash the actors that I might get told off <laughs> But then we were all saying, no, you've got to actually squash us so that we're squashed. Otherwise, we'll do, I'm doing sort of uh, rubbish shoulder acting and actually the thing's over here. It's not actually touching me. So, so they took us at our word. So on a couple of those takes, we can barely breathe because there's six burly goose going, let's crush them. Uh. Forklift trucks with it's all full of spikes coming in to crush us and thinking, how long has this sequence been going on? It feels like 10 minutes. It feels like you should have been speared to death by now. And Lister's still going on and on and on and on to wrap the plot up. 
So obviously you've got to just take the word of the director that it'll be all right in the edit. It won't seem as long. In the end, I think Nick did a fantastic job in the edit and we maybe got away with it. You're a big, big disappointment to me, David. <laughs> you really are. What? No ambition. Titting about. Whole speeches uh, from that are taken from my dad talking to me. Um, about, um, you know, where you live in our house under my roof, you live by, by our rules and blah, 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 blah. When I was being at my most tossiest and getting kicked out of university and not really knowing what I wanted to do, maybe he wants to be a comedy writer. And, you know, me and Rob, we really think we're really good. Uh, and him just thinking, God, what an idiot. This might be the answer as to why I feel so empty. But if she had my kids, that means my kids might have had kids. There might be hundreds of generations spawned by me. So this won't matter to you now. Arnold, I'm not your father. <laughs> but that's impossible. It's not true. There was a kind of a, a failed parenting theme running through that. And I think the very nature of parenting is that you fail. A lot of the time I find I'm giving advice to what would be me at his age. The realisation too late, my son is 18 now, too late that your children don't do what you say, they do what you do. <laughs> so you tell them not to do something and then they see you doing that thing you've told them not to do. And the reasoning behind you telling them not to do is perfectly legitimate, benign, you're trying to help them, you want to guide them so that they're better. And then they see you doing exactly the thing you've just told them not to do. And guess what? They do that. <laughs> Oh my God, that's just me. You know, I'm, I'm like that person. Can't sit still, da 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 da. And I'm knocking my own boy for being exactly the same as me. And so, you know, it's the major hypocrisy involved in being a parent. I'm listening to myself sometimes thinking, yeah, that's, that's, what, that's what my dad told me. Did I listen to him? No. Um, and it takes you, you know, 35 years to suddenly realize that actually they might've had a point. Very hard to impress upon someone when they're a teenager or in their early 20s, how quick it all is. It's very difficult to impress on them that it's actually the blink of an eye and, um, and you're, you're nearly 50, you know, and uh, if you could get them to understand that, you might be able to get through a little bit quicker, but you never can. And I know with my kids, they just, they just think I'm a moaning old fart. Well, I probably am. <laughs> I mean, that was sort of, in a sense, echoed by uh, Doug and Richard on the set. You know, seeing them together it was really nice. They obviously get on really well. There's obviously, you know, mutual respect between them. <laughs> when you're in a mess like we were in from day one, it's really important, one, to keep your head and two, to make sure the shows are good. And you kind of have to be almost blinkered of, don't worry about show five, don't worry about show six, make show one as good as, it po as you can possibly make it, and then start worrying about show two and the... Uh... Lemons, oh my days, what an episode. I never want to pick out a favorite episode, but if under pressure, if I was waterboarded, I'd say lemons because I just think it's genius. In some ways, my favourite of all of them. I think I've got a really cool idea for show three. And um, basically, they meet Jesus and Joe says, stop, stop. And I went, what? He hadn't heard it. He said, no, I don't need to hear it. Um, we'll never sell it in Utah. I think it can be fun to bring Jesus on board and, and explore that thing of, just how little he would know and how useless he would be. And I think the first talk was just this, Jesus trying to be really helpful and nice and like, oh, maybe you could do this. And they're just so, just shut up, you don't know anything. Just, you know, I thought that was a funny idea. And then from that came the, how would they get there? How could they get back? The lemons. Now legendary forest scene that we call it. The first time we filmed it, it was cold. The second time we did it, it was very cold. Beautiful day. But we got there the second time. The first time, I think we the the cameras uh, 
dropped frames or, or, or something along those lines. Nick, the editor, said that he was noticing dropped frames because the audio wasn't syncing up with the picture. It's the clippy things are important. Trees. This could be Earth. Earth. It's always Earth with you guys. And he couldn't work it out because these dropped frames were very subtle to start with. In a normal one second, there should be 25 frames of image, which makes up that second, and there were 23. And we filmed, went and filmed it again, and it dropped frames again, but they managed to work out that the frames it had dropped were different than the frames it had dropped last time, so they can marry the two together and bingo, we've got, <laughs> we've got a scene. <laughs> and then there's a technique called interpolation, where they're able to take frame one and frame three and create frame two in the middle, which was why we had to use the tape we did. And so you actually see Craig do a little stumble over some twig or something or branch. We had no choice but to use that take or actually go out there a third time, by which time I think the cast would have just killed us. <laughs> right, okay, Robert, uh, Robert's good, Chris. Sorry, right, Jason's done it. And, and Craig's good, really. Great. Yeah. We did it the first time, and the guys liked that scene a lot. They came back the next time, they started doing the lines, and Doug goes, cut, why have you changed it? It's good, the first scene, why have you, why have you changed all the dialogue? And they said, why have you changed it? Why have you rewritten it? We thought it was a really good scene. Why have you rewritten everything? And he said, I haven't rewritten everything. We looked at the scripts, and the scripts they'd been given were all the old drafts of the very, very original scene. So they would frantically spent the whole makeup time learning these lines. It's a testament to them, because they didn't go, Doug's, this scene worked really well, and now, under really difficult circumstances, when we have to go out in the freezing cold, he's then completely rewritten the scene and expects us to learn it in an hour. They just went out there and did it. That was just a little extra challenge. Here comes Charles. I think he's got exhibit A, the missing script. Have we got to follow it against this to make sure it's the right one? I'm just mixing the rest of the blue stuff. They haven't discovered that yet, sir. Jesus. Yes. We thought that might get a titter. And that got a huge laugh through all of us. Difficult thing to do right that, you know, what with timing and stuff like that. We're just sitting there waiting for this bloody laugh to subside again. Somebody's like, can't And, see and he uses oh, the word yes. act. Cheers. Yeah, Tea while you work. Always good. Wow. Oh. What? Not a difficult shot, this. But uh, what tea is going down well. Yeah. Been asleep for a while. I know that. Five feet. Five feet. Ten feet. I will be in the tavern drinking wine in great plenty until my legs do the dance of a newly born cow. And I just felt it was funny for him to be a Geordie, because I thought it won't be funny if he's doing the sort of Jesus and I am a very holy man. Again, Jesus with that sort of mild Geordie accent was just brilliant. I shit myself, mate, when they said I got the part of me. I mean, obviously, I, I hoped that I'd got it, you know, because it's such a great part to play. But, uh, yeah, man, there's a lot of kind of pressure, you know, because it's kind of one of them things that... Um, TV series that was so big, then when they come back, there's a lot of pressure on them to be good. It was James, a brilliant actor. He was such a he was such a wonderful guy to work with, and just really got into it. I mean, he was, he loved it. I don't know why, but I thought I was being a bit heightist. I thought maybe he should be taller, Jesus. You think of these iconic figures being, you know, really tall and whatever, and so the idea of Jesus being maybe five four, um, you know, did sort of amuse me. It was good because Jesus was only small, right? But if you think about it, if you go to, like, a Westminster Abbey and you see the armour of King Edward II or something like that, I mean, it's tiny armour. People were a lot smaller then, so we were a bit like giants. But then we saw the, <laughs> the Roman Legion. Man, that guy was big. His arms were bigger than my waist. He was, like, he was massive. I wasn't ready! Originally in the script, they went to Italy first. They were like, oh, we're here. And it was like, no, we don't have lemons. You've got to go to India, which was a, a you know, funny joke until uh, Michael Ralph, the uh, production designer, came and he just went, please, please, can you get rid of this, it this Italy set? I can't do both. I would just thought I'd probably take you through this quickly, the Indian set, and show you uh, what we've achieved. And uh, one of the better angles is when you back up to this door altogether and you get the deepest part of the set and you start to realise you can frame out the lighting 
and the top of the set doesn't become an issue and you start to see the depth of the set all the way through which is fantastic. It was quite a challenge um, to, to make something look like it's outdoors and try and make it look believable. I used somewhere in the region of 120,000 watts of light. We built colonnaded areas through here so that we could do tracking shots and walking shots and we can mess up the geography of the place. So even though you can see it in one wide shot and it gives you a whole look of the place, um, you can take independent shots in different directions with foreground and midground and walking colonnaded areas and you can mix it up a little and geographically run in different directions and you can't really tell uh, what part of the set you're in. did a lot of that in the old days. I mean, how many times did we run up and down corridors that were like, you know, 20, 30, 40 foot long? And somehow it looked like a very long section of corridor. <laughs> Chaps, one more little different route and then we're done on the chase. These um, columns uh, obviously are just fiberglass, but there's got a great stone quality. All the timber work that's in the roof, we uh, produce literally to give us shadow work through here so that we constantly get a, a nice shadowing across the hands and across faces and people in the columns. So that even though to the camera now this seems quite brightly lit, when you grade it, it'll come down and all your darks and blacks will go deeper and the shadows will become more um, genre driven and I think we'll have much more stronger feel under here. Um, it wanders through this way, as you can see. We've set up trade areas such as pottery and we've also done herbs and spices and um, bread. The detail's just incredible in it. And when, when we first came on, that all the spices out and uh, the food in Shepparton Studios is not very good. But came in, I just wanted an Indian man. Even with a rubber mask on, I was just walking and going, ah, you know, like, the extras were amazing. They were just such fun. So I think some of them slightly baffled by what was going on. A lovely actress in this scene. Jesus. Playing Erin just asked Robert if he's wearing a mask. Hey, sir. Uh, yeah. In Dwarf, if you go back in time, it's great to do it as authentic as possible because it just makes it real. I think it just adds to the humour. If you get that authenticity, the comedy then is heightened. We did pre-fit the majority of them uh, the day before, but I tried to give everyone a sort of identity. There might be a camera shot that will just catch one old boy in the corner who just had a fantastic look. So I'm dressed like this, with a funny moustache, so that I can light the fires in the marketplace and mingle with the rest of the extras. And uh, it should be good. It's, uh, it's how to disguise the props department. Oh. <laughs> Something like we didn't have time to remove the Trojan um, spaceship. So behind those large columns there, uh, architectural columns is the actual uh, transporter units from the Trojan. So the Trojan's still built within the walls of this. This, in fact, is the Trojan set rebuilt into India because the turnaround time wasn't quick enough. This central base here is, if when you watch the show, the Trojan chair that Rimmer sits on is, is actually that base. And I've just built it and turned it into a well. Um, so everything gets a secondary use. He, he, he looks like someone who's just seen his wife for, for the first time in a very long time. That little this, this is what you, this is your swagger coming through. I'll show you what you look like. Right? This is what you was doing. <laughs> you know that wide walk, you know, you sort of swing round the meat and veg. Yeah? <laughs> See, yeah, letting a bit I'm of air in there to cool down. <laughs> yeah. He's shaking it out, yeah. you know. <laughs> See, uh, to let the equipment cool down. Oh, yeah. right, yeah. Yeah. Throwing the old lemon up and down. I casually. would find it impossible to comment. <laughs> <laughs> or to simplify, the other, the copper coin, which is a ductile metal with high thermal and electrical conductivity, serves as the positive electrode, and the, uh, the galvanized nail is the electron-producing negative electrode. For some reason, I don't know. Bigger idiot for. 
board for a small idea. <laughs> the thing about that speech was, having presented an enormous amount of science television, I actually do understand it. So that I kind of uh, genuinely understand the science. That said, <laughs> it was a very long and complicated speech. It worked. Something that I, from all the documentaries on technical stuff and engineering that I've done, I didn't actually believe that worked, but it did. They measured up against a multimeter or something, and it, it does work. 6.12 six, six six volts you're getting off that. Really? Have you tested yeah, it? We've tested it. You're really? Yeah, no, bloody hell. Yeah, it does. That's what you measure. Sure. Lemons. Sure. Well, start again. It's an 8-volt battery. Well, they actually did it for real. They put the copper coin galvanised nail, wired it up in series. There was an actual readable voltage coming out of it, which was fantastic. So when we lifted all that, that really was a battery. I did the lemons thing by myself, by going lemon battery, and then I got really stuck on galvanised nails. Oh, and there's no place to go, really, for how do you build galvanised nails in 23 AD? You can't Google it. So I put it on Twitter, and one of my followers, Natasha Rankin, really helped me with the galvanised nails research. So, yeah, that was good. We had to operate on Jesus to remove his kidney stone. That was fed in from reality, because I've had a kidney stone, and it's not much fun. And I think Doug's had a kidney stone, which I think is probably why he's written about it, because it, it is... Very painful, and the only way I know how to judge the levels of pain from kidney stones is it must run in my family, because my sister's had one, and she said she'd give birth any day rather than have a kidney stone. That was a scene I'd read before, because it was a scene taken from uh, the long-awaited, abandoned Red Dwarf movie, and we were doing that operation on Captain Hollister. And it was like, I don't want to hold it, you hold it. A great set piece uh, for all of us, but of course, you know, for Rimmer, what a claim to fame to uh, have held the great man's uh, todger for, for this particular operation. <laughs> he truly is blessed. So Jesus had gallstone taken out by the Red Dwarf cast, so what? I mean, oh, it's almost as if a man made up these commandments to keep a primitive people in check. It's a really nice kind of section, that, that... Um that you get Jesus running out onto the, the street and talking about the commandments he's going to break. And when people argue with him, he explains the sheer no bloody-minded contradictions in what a God does versus what the commandments are. And whatever your faith may be, it's good to have these things interrogated. We both said that at the same time. <laughs> and that, what's going on? <laughs> Why are we saying everything together, nearly? <laughs> There's an evil room in, De in Doug's head. <laughs> there's, there's an evil little green monster in the game. <laughs> Give it to Danny and Robert. <laughs> if you're doing it on your own, you can sort of do some characterization thing that get you over a fluff or... But when you've got to have... You know, it's got to be crystal clear, it's got to be in sync, and it's got to be funny. That's a real pressure. Danny and I have quite a different rhythm in our speech. And so we spent a lot of time trying to just kind of find a midway point where we spoke like this, so we kept it going all the time, leave a break there. I think I went more to Robert's rhythm. And, you know, it was, say that again, Rob, and then go on. You know, we did it in the most, like, almost like a dance routine. That was Danny's theory, was we do it like a dance routine, then we'll get in the same, you know... <laughs> <laughs> that went out the window pretty quick. We did it in rehearsal once and it was like literally flawless. And then what happens in that scenario, you learn something that, and then it goes backwards for a while. You start getting worse at it and then we thought, you know what, Robert said, let's just leave it and then we'll go at it tonight. <laughs> when we did it and pulled it off, it was just great. It was like... Obviously, I am extremely afraid of a comedy monkey because we know how dangerous that is because it's so utterly cheap and we've seen all the jokes. I think it's something people can focus on. I think lots of people were very keen on the monkey to start with. I think the monkey works incredibly well. I thought it was very well acted. Dave loved the monkey. Everybody loves the monkey. Well, that was the other thing. It was, God, this chimp is great. You, you know, this is so hilarious. God, you know, the chimp, bloody hell, get him in. Make, bring him as a regular character. I did then a second half where it was 
more about the monkey, but it was related to the characters. So um, Rimmer realizes the monkey's really smart. He wants him to try and pass um, the astronauts for him, and he wants to keep the monkey's intelligence a secret, which I thought was a good Rimmer idea. And we finish show three, Lemons, and Sarah, the vision mixer, goes, oh, what, what are we doing next week, Doug? I think it might have been the vision mixer who said, oh, so you've got, you know, a chimp guy in this. And Doug was like, yeah, yeah. She goes, yeah, you know, what are you going to do about the fact they can only work for 45 minutes at a time? And then they need an hour rest. And Doug was like, what? Usually the casting department would deal with this, but on this occasion, they weren't involved. So the shooting restriction problem didn't filter down the production food chain in the way it would normally. It was um, a bit of a mind blow. So then it was like, right, out goes the chimp. I went that weekend and basically threw away that second half and did a new second half. It's like wearing a barbed wire thong, but it's also attached to your neck, so when you sit on it, it's like that on your on your neck and your uh, and your chin. There's quite all numbers of drooping, sir. Can this cat get this, please? I was just saw I thought he was going to fall off. Come and play with my groin. It is very much like playing as a kid. You get involved in a little story with your mates and you're sort of doing the mime. So you're stuck outside in space and I'm going, I can't eat. You know, all that. It's, it was that kind of naff, but it just worked. <laughs> <laughs> that helmet is so hot, it's so your, your nose is right next to it there, your teeth are rubbing against it. If you bang that, it's like, whoa, it's really sore, and that backpack's really, really heavy. It's actually a MiG flight helmet. It's an original flight suit, and of course we've embellished and added pieces to it. So it weighs a ton, and when he had his backpack on, um, bless, he could, he could hardly move, but it looked great. No teeth. OK. Very important scene coming up. I'm not going to say anything. Though I have mentioned it, yeah? I made me own. I made me own. Steve Wicken, who played my Gelf bride back in the day, he came to play one of the begs, biologically engineered garbage gobblers. Even Craig had trouble with that line. That really cheered me up. <laughs> what is it, Bobby? It's one of your lines. You know, it's like biological bollocks, you know, whatever. <laughs> it's been 18 years since I was here last as the Gelf Bride. Still lathered in uh, makeup and latex and costume and uh, doing the same kind of thing. He's still keen on me. He's not made of wood. <laughs> <laughs> he was a hottie then, he's a hottie now. Eighteen years ago, I do remember the makeup took at least four hours. This time, we were down to about an hour. The smell, the atmosphere, it feels like full. <laughs> My name is Peter Elliott and I am playing the female Professor Chimp in Red Dwarf. There was this whole saga with the chimp. Couldn't get a real chimp, it's illegal in this country. But don't worry, we're going to get this chimp man, we were told, who is, you know, basically the real thing. Brilliant. <laughs> there was a couple of moments in that episode when Peter Elliott playing the chimp, who we'd met before, and Peter Elliott is a human being, and then we saw him in his chimp co costume, but then standing up and talking. It's, it's a bloke in a chimp costume, you know, you've seen that. And then he put the head on, and then, and then even then, he was be standing around and he, and he has a tube to get cooler air in, because he gets very hot. And then he puts the arm extenders on and he becomes a chimp. And I was scared. We were all actually scared. Having this chimp going, ooh, 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 around and like breaking things, chucking stuff was like, <laughs> there was a certain amount of alarm. He does it so well. <laughs> 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 As animals, they're quite destructive, but they had to tell me quite firmly that the set isn't practical because, of course, they wanted me to hang off stuff. I could quite easily have destroyed the set in about two minutes. When you're right next to him, I mean, the face, the animatronic face, it isn't like a plastic chimp face that you get for, for a party mask. It moves and it's going, ooh, ooh, ooh. 
do all these, and his noises are freaky. You can actually tell exactly what they're saying. They do um, grunts, hoots, whimpers, barks, and screams. So now if you think about those sounds, if I just go to you like, ah, it's pretty obvious I'm telling you to go away. You don't actually need to know that language. You can read the body language. You can tell, <laughs> means I'm, I'm scared. When you're very near the chimp, and he's doing the faces. You can actually hear, which is all the little solenoids in the mask, making the eyes go like that and the nose flares out a bit. I mean, it's unbelievable stuff. I, I think they were right to sort of trim the chimp down. Plus, I don't know about you, but I, it wasn't that convincing to me on camera. Because you, you automatically think, you know, monkey's just going to sort of go absolutely nuts permanently, but of course he had all the subtleties thrown in. It was just fascinating to watch him. It seems quite strange. Let me get this right. Essentially a torch, so it's very easy to use. <laughs> well, there was the whole Professor Edgington situation that, that we didn't know how that was going to pan out because we hadn't met the good Professor. We'd seen her legs, which weren't hers, if you see what I mean. Hello, <laughs> Give <laughs> your monkey. Let's reset positions, let's keep running. We're locked. Are we happy to switch? Yeah. The only thing that's not locked is the boys, obviously. That's right, we've got the boys now. Evolution mode engaged. Oh, Smeg! The show. I'm afraid you wouldn't see the end of the show <laughs> tonight. Uh, so sorry about that. Well, the audience didn't see that. That was one of the things. They didn't seem to mind at all that night that we didn't have an ending to the show. <laughs> it just sort of stopped. That was going into the unknown a bit, because we'd never really been in front of a studio audience where we hadn't had a complete show. It hadn't been cast because it couldn't have been cast because that ending came in over the weekend and there was no point in casting quickly. We thought, we'll get it right and we'll pick up the end in the pickup week. And then we just filmed that um, in the pickup week, which is a, which was last week, as we speak now. Essentially, when she turns up in the episode, she's naked. And so we didn't have to worry about that. I think the white coat just signifies Professor. We do give her the glasses, because it all gives an air of authority and can make one look very intelligent, as you know. Wearing the glasses upside down on be, be quest of Craig Charles, she did it, she went along with everything. One thing I love about Red Dwarf is there's a freedom that you can go up to an actor and say, why don't you try like that? I'd all in one day, which was nice, but tiring. So, uh, yeah, full on, but lots of fun. I managed to kind of fall over myself rather than fall over the box, so nearly death by heels, I think. Have you got a pen? <laughs> I knew they'd break his heart. <laughs> Human race here one minute, gone the next. Bye bye, night. Liberty gibbets. <laughs> this place is a total shithole. It's a bit like one of those episodes that we did in, back in the day when we'd spent loads of money on four of the episodes and we'd run out of money and it was a case of bringing everything down so there's no big sets or nothing like that, and just bringing, making everything small. This is the show that sorts the men out from the boys. There's nowhere to hide, nowhere to run. We're going to put you out there virtually naked. When it is just the writing and the storyline and the performance, I think it's a different challenge. <laughs> <laughs> no, that's not in it. Is it? No. <laughs> <laughs> is it this <laughs> It's a little private joke between me and Mr. <laughs> but an awful lot of rewrites, you know. Make <laughs> you happy? I'm very happy, Jim. Happy. I think there is room in a series to do something like that. A less demanding plot, if you like, a sort of just a nice, gentle um, easing through. So, show five, I thought I'm going to make it really simple, really talky. All the bits are really good. I mean, a lot of these are kind of set-piece discussions that Doug had come up with prior to this about moves and about whether you've accidentally ever got anyone pregnant and stuff like that. And the set-piece conversations are great and a really old-school Red Dwarf. It's part <laughs> and reducing battle oh, bollocks. <laughs> No, zombies! Zombies! I'm being replaced, aren't I? So, no one likes me. People have complained about the shape of my head. Strangling. A giant death world. A giant death world heading straight for us. That was weird. We all did each other's lines. In the script, it says, Rimmer says, 
it's a space pod. Crichton says it's a male pod. Because I'd suddenly hear Chris doing a line that effectively was mine in the script. We just kind of knew what it was, and Danny was just off on one. Very difficult scene, more for the boys than me. Because that stuff was really, like, precise and finicky, and I think I had the easy job in that scene. Well, who's this Roy dude? He worked in a bank with her. Always use the finger weapon machine to help <laughs> uh, And don't be tempted to wonder if she squidged up her nose for him in the, in the really in that really cute way she used to squidge up her nose for you. The finger wetting machine laugh was phenomenal. You wish you could have one like that in every scene. It's funny because what you have there, which made it a, a bigger laugh as that, was yes, you had a funny line, but then you add a little bit of physicality to it. I think you just have to laugh. While his finger wetting machine was working overtime. <laughs> but it didn't properly have a story. Although there was this thing with a male and it did have a payoff. So we were able to end the episode with Hayley Summers tag that we always had. So it felt like there was just a bit that was missing, which there was but it hadn't been thought of, let alone written. So, now, the next section we haven't actually recorded, but we will be playing you a scene near the end of the show, um, after he finds the letter. It's essentially like watching Star Wars, uh, right? The original Star Wars, New Hope, and you watch it all the way to when they're in the Death Star, and then you go, oh, can't show the rest of it, and the next thing, they're <laughs> getting medals. <laughs> Tonight. As the series has gone on, the rewrites have come in later and later, and everyone else would finish on a Friday night going, hurrah, it's all done, and we've done it, and we've got look at the laughs we got, and, thing. and you'd see Doug sloping out the back door, going, oh, I'm going to have to be writing all weekend again. Exhausted having directed all week. It is quite nerve-wracking where you don't know how to pitch it, uh, where it's gone, especially when you're doing, see you're doing end scenes, but there's bits of scenes in the middle that haven't been done, you know, so you do worry that you're pitching the end of it right emotionally and that kind of stuff. What an absolute slag. <laughs> <laughs> Dear Dave, a, and a great ending on that simple story that they were hanging on to tenterhooks, you know, and a great ending, and Craig did a great job. I think the line is absolutely right for Lister in that moment, and... If this was a character who hated women, it would be one thing, but he's very much not that character. And the fact he has the big speech about what a wonderful woman she is, what a wonderful mother she would have made, and then the thing, and it's the crushing disappointment that makes him say that line. Um, and I did consider maybe changing it and making it so, uh, something softer, but in the end, you're either in or you're out, and it, it's not funny with something softer. What an absolute troll! <laughs> I was also influenced by the audience's reaction. And in fact, the first thing I said, because it was such a big laugh, I went, I'm so glad that they reacted like that. Because if they hadn't, it would have been straight out. Where are you going with this rumor? I'm saying you had no success in this department when your sperm were young and goofy, when they were out every night frolicking and free. You've got old sperm now, Listy. They're not so sprightly. They swim into a womb and can't remember why they came in. They don't know what they're doing, who they are, where they're going. They have to stop every five minutes and ask directions. They don't want to break into any eggs and fertilise them. They want to watch Countdown and do crosswords. You didn't think I'd find out. Oh, all those drinks and chocolate bars you were getting off me and at the same time you were drinking her drinks and snapping up her chocky bars too, weren't you? Weren't you? Conversations with Rich and we came up with the idea of the jealousy battle with the two vending machines. And then we shot that and that went in and then we then had a show which was about to time but it wasn't a full story. We've just filmed it because we didn't film all of that in front of the audience and on the pickup week we just filmed me with the dispenser where I'm taking her out and showing her the corridor and all that, and then she falls over and I fall on top of her and I'm trying to get up and it looks like I'm humping her. It's romantic. Well, don't build your hopes up too much. It might not be as great as you think. In retrospect, you think, well, it would have been great to do that in front of an audience, but it's funny. Um, and, of course, you've got Rimmer in the background sort of going, yes! <laughs> <laughs>
It was just really Chris's look as there's Craig on the vending machine and you actually see Craig doing it. It's so wrong. And it became apparent that with all the stuff we had to shoot, we weren't actually going to be able to get round to shoot the new missing scenes in the pickup week. We could have done if we'd either done an extra day and shot it, or as I suggested, get two extra cameras and have two units shooting simultaneously with me directing one and Richard directing the other one. We had two DRPs because Ed Moore's a DRP as well as Andy. So that had been possible to do it and get across the line. But that didn't happen. We needed one more day on the set. All the sets were there. It was all ready. We just needed that one day. <laughs> uh, and as we, as we recalled this interview, <laughs> We still don't know the entire um, final look of that particular app. But it has to be said, the final version of the script was definitely better as a result of us not getting the extra cameras, as it allowed us time to regroup, rewrite, law of averages, something's going to work out eventually. It's because we're on T-Stage, which is a different studio. We're doing uh, pickups for episode five, predominantly. <laughs> the story has been grafted elegantly on to the existing tale that we had and intertwines around it. We're just moving money around. It's totally above board. I'll get on it right away. Great plan. A lousy plan. <laughs> but I've got a question for you. <laughs> they have absolutely no option but to request you stop writing them. <laughs> Jumbo As everyone knows, story is the hardest thing. And when it's like you've got a day, two days, um, you know, and it became Dear Dave, which under the circumstances, I, th I think no one will ever know what a success that episode was. So I wanted to find out if we had the original BBC footage, which was shot on film, so we'd be able to use it now, you know, we'd still be HD. Uh, of the original series one and two model shots. And they'd lost them. So we knew that we didn't have any miniature shots that we could use, any of the old Red Wolf stuff, any of the old Starbuck stuff. And I reckon the cost to shoot it today with the same kind of motion control system would probably be about £200,000. Obviously, you can't have a series of Red Wolf without any shots of Red Wolf or Starbuck. Also, the post house who were doing our vis effects didn't really do miniatures, they specialised in CGI which generally costs even more than miniatures. So those in charge of the budget had a real problem, Bray. We borrowed a Starbug from Mike Tucker, who was one of the original model makers. He's actually got one. We've got a blue midget that was made for the remastered. So that exists. And then we've got the long pencil shape Red Dwarf, which is a bit wonky. The Red Dwarf model, poor thing, had been in the dust for quite some time. It was huge and heavy and a, took a lot to lift it up and get it into the air. And Doug immediately wanted to be reinvented. It needed to be something that reflected what Doug now would prefer the dwarf to look like, what the fans would prefer the dwarf to look like. We cut and refashioned it. We cut quite a lot off it. And we ended up cutting out approximately, just, just under two metres from the centre section. Quite a tricky operation because the model itself was old. And over the years, the glues have deteriorated. Um, so every time you picked anything up or, or moved it, bits would just, just rain off. So we had to go over the whole model um, and re-glue all the existing parts, as well as reconfigure it, all the panels, and to make up for the, for the missing two metres in the middle. When we first had the model in, there was the hand we found, uh, which was like Crichton's hand in one of the bays. That bay actually was taken off, but we took the hand off and we actually put it back. And I think, I think it's just here, behind me, here in the corner. Charles asked me to come and see him to say that he wanted to bring the miniature shoot forward so we were shooting simultaneously show six and the miniatures. And I said, but that's not possible because I can't direct both. And he said, no, 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 the miniatures don't need to be directed. And I went, yeah, they do. We had to move it forward because we needed to use um, the people that we already had contracted and working on it, um, which didn't give Doug enough time. No one had enough time, no one was ready, nothing was prepared. And you need a Red Dwarf director there to go, look, this is the series, because 
A Red Dwarf flyby isn't just a Red Dwarf flyby. It can mean all sorts of things. The opening Red Dwarf shot is flying away from the sun because it establishes the sun. That's a specific shot. In show three, the Red Dwarf shot's flying towards a kind of Jesus star with sand and desert, three kings. It's a thematic shot. And there's no director there, and it was never going to work. I was in the workshop with Michael, and they said, We've got, we need these craft for show six. And Michael's going, Where, how am I going to get this done? Where am I going to get it done? You know, how can we build something in, like, 24 hours? At this point, the Death Ship didn't exist. The Annihilators didn't exist. The Meteors didn't exist. Neither did the Meteor Cavern. So all this was being prepared on the day of the actual shoot. So it wasn't just me who was affected, it was the entire production team. The art department were trying to come up with solutions overnight and uh, Doug was only getting to see the results the morning of the shoot. And then everything happened on the day, even with Blue Midget, the scene with, <laughs> with the meteorites, that was on the day. Michael's trying to come up with ideas. What's that? And they go, oh, oh th those are your meteors. I went, what is that stuff? And he said, oh, it's black wrap. Don't be so down, it's going to be great. It'll be textured with, with rock-looking things and they'll be rotated, it'll be great. We really only had a, a literally a night to pull together the model of the Death Ship and I'm not quite sure at this stage yet whether that Death Ship model worked. Because it was only literally a night to pull a model together on camera, we are fighting quite a lot of issues. I mean, when you're starting to look at models in such close detail, it was a hard call. We succeeded in producing something. Whether or not it was good enough in the end, I'm not sure yet. We hope so. We're shooting on the Red Epic. Red Epic as well. And one interesting situation that I've put forward on this is that the main action photography is being shot at 4K. And this is to satisfy future usage, high definition, yes. Blu-ray and, and the rest of it. Whereas on the miniatures, because we're shooting them very close yes. up, uh, I've opted to shoot at 2K resolution. And this is only to take the edge off the models. It also allows us to shoot on a, the equivalent of a 16mm format, which helps us with focus issues. Yeah, the problem with shooting 2K in the first case is uh, it produces it with a letterbox. It's not 16 by 9 Therefore, any spaceship or model that goes over the edge, top or bottom, must zoom picturing, otherwise you'll see it cropped in the middle of the frame. It became very clear then that we had to reshoot everything, this time with me directing. I tried to get Bill Pearson into the series at the beginning, taking people to his workshop and going, Bill's got all this stuff, guns, miniatures, all sorts. He's such a friend of the show, please let's use him. And they didn't want to use him for whatever reason. So I then went to Bill. Everyone's wrapped, we're in the edit. It's clear that these model shots are just unusable and slumped in. And I said to Bill, Bill, I am real shit here. Um, can you help me out? The model shoot went disastrously wrong. Uh, so there was going to be half as much time uh, to achieve uh, a lot of um, a lot of individual shots. We went back to it but when you go back to something you always go well I'm, in, I'm doing it in a couple of months time or whenever I'm doing it and you go well we could always do this and be nice to have that and then various other people have a look at it who do models and whatever and they go well we could do this and we could do that and then you go whoa um, and then you have a second model shoot. Some might believe we spent much more than the first miniature shoot that's not the case at all. We got a space station for free the first shoot didn't have a space station at all. They didn't have time to build it. We got an annihilator for free. Their annihilator was built in less than 24 hours and just wasn't up to it. Their death ship, again, wasn't really up to it. Our death ship, yes, true, was built by Bill Pearson over two, three weeks. And I think we can see the results stand for themselves. Absolutely marvelous. The cavern the first shoot had was made out of black wrap. Even using that, it would amount it would have to have been textured, which would have cost a small fortune, whereas we actually built ours out of real material to avoid that CGI expense. Our meteorites were real rocks I bought from aquarium, which we hung on string. The first shoots was again this aluminium black wrap, which again would have had to have been textured and wouldn't have looked nearly as good as, as the meteorites that we ultimately aim for. So really the only thing that we had that the original shoot didn't have was we had a bigature. Uh, we only had a week to do it. A lot of the parts 
uh, cast resin castings from stuff that Bill Pearson had made a long time ago that we managed to, to refurb and, and get on there. It adds a lot of value to the detail. We made it so that a lot of these panels pop out and can be replaced as there's two or three different configurations of this using 20 uh, different panels. For example, we've got a little landing bay which slots into here and it literally takes a few seconds to uh, flip them out. Not sure if I should be telling you this. These, these slides, they're Steve Howarth's holiday photos, which actually, with the right lighting, they kind of, they work really well when the camera pans by. I think there's some girls roller skating in there. To be fair to the, the guys who had made the original Red Dwarf, it was, uh, it was built over 12 years ago. I know there had been some changes made to it, like shortening it for one thing. But 12 years is a long time for adhesives. And bits had dropped off, tape lines had started to curl up. Uh, so our first task was actually trying to spruce up the dwarf model. Lots of plastic had warped and it had been chopped and changed and, and that all needed wire woolen back and re-dirtying and uh, quite, a, quite a job, but uh, it smartened it up uh, quite a lot. Uh, it didn't make it perfect, but it was a lot better. The first one didn't work, so we needed someone else. The person that I really trusted inside out about these kind of technical matters was Dean Thrussell. Who, and I rang Dean and I said, Dean, we're having a nightmare here, these models. He said, if I was going to do it, really simple, shoot it 4K, one big light, backlight it, you know, we get some anamorphic lenses on it, really simple. And then he said, you know what, I should come shoot it for you. It's just lovely working with Doug. Um, I think we're like two naughty schoolboys on a film set, um, and we have a lot of fun. Maybe don't do it until you can get a good... 35. 40. 45. I've read up on it, we've gone through it, we've looked what everyone else did on Star Wars or on great things like Alien or Blade Runner, and we've tried to bring a lot of those tricks in as much as we possibly can, and a lot of it has been trial and error as well, and that's back to why the Epic's been great, because we've had a HD video tap all the time, and we've been able to look at it and go, that looks good. And when it looks good, it's good. And when it isn't good, we can fix it and play with it on the monitor until it looks good. Neil in the green suit has entertained me more than anything else on this. When we shoot spaceships, we shoot them against green, and the reason we do that is the same as the weather girl. We key out the background and we put in space afterwards. The problem was that the space crafts needed to move, so someone needs to operate them and make them move. And the only way to do that is for somebody to operate them and make them move. So what we had to do is we had to dress them in green, which I found so entertaining, because we had this little green leotard, and poor Neil, bless him, had to be dressed up in the little green leotard to operate the suit, which kept me entertained all day. We'd need someone in a green screen suit. So I bought one off eBay. And uh, of course it arrived, I didn't intend to, but I couldn't resist putting it on. Uh, and then when you've got it on, it zips up right to the head. It's really difficult to actually get it off. In fact, you can't get it off. It's impossible, you need um, someone to help you. And for a long, long time, my wife refused to help me, so I wandered around uh, one very long Friday night in my green screen suit. <laughs> We go in the edit suite and we see Nick's put everything together and locked all these bits together. It just, you go, wow, did we shoot all those bits? Did we make that happen? And I think it's quite a mag it is quite a magical thing to be involved in. Sounds fair to me. Oh, Rimmer, butt out, man. Don't encourage you. I'm just saying, that's not a bad deal. All things considered, he'll take it. You all accept the challenge, homo? Okay, man, you're always doing this, picking fights and then challenging us to a duel across time and space. No, I'm not. Yes, you are. No, I'm not. Yes, you smacking are. Oh. There were scenes in that from the film script, weren't there? Now, if I read the film script again, I'll go, oh, I get it. When that script arrived, I thought, well, we've rehearsed this one. <laughs> <laughs> oh, yeah, like we stand a chance. OK, What's wrong with that? How about you do your botanical gardens for me? On the walk? Yeah. Okay. Uh, <coughs> what's Chris's line? How about a ping-pong marathon? Get some buddies together, rogue nuts against the water. 
taking something which the last time I'd seen it, it was a $15 million movie script. Sorry, the half an hour one wasn't a $15 million, but, um, but that's where it had come from. I think was very difficult for everyone involved in it. But it's like a really s slimmed down uh, version of what was one of the film scripts. I mean, because that film script went through so many versions as well. I mean, and there are little cherry picked bits from that. It all came together in a, in a very good final episode. Yeah. <laughs> what I'm really worried about is where are we going to read it? <laughs> yeah, well, I know, because I knew I couldn't read this bit, but I've been trying to learn. There's no, there's no way to yeah. stick lines. <laughs> Where Rich came to me and said, they've got a problem with show six. And this was a couple of weeks after it had been handed in. And I had a little kind of meeting where I was kind of ushered into a room with Michael, the production designer, and, and Charles. And it was, we can't build these sets. For the most part, show six is a really simple, talky show. But obviously, at this stage, it was, this script is done, it's in the bank, let's make it. I think Charles was asking for a rewrite to take out all the new sets over the weekend. And Rich quite rightly pointed out, you can't come up with a new funny 20 minutes and a replacement story in two days, especially not in the state I was in at the time. Most zombies look better than me at this point. So there was a go have a word with Doug. We don't want to bother him, but you sort it out. So I was sort of like, this script, like, the sooner everyone believes it, the better. So when Rich told me this, I then had, and I, it was a meeting that lasted about five minutes with Michael. And I said, I understand that you've got some um, difficulties with the sets. He went, sure. And I went, OK, here we go. Here are the three sets. Death ship, black curtains, candles, table, and then any three walls with some tin cases as a, as a desk, a driver, and we need to turn that into Blue Midget. Charles was initially concerned we couldn't build the sets in time, but after I'd explained to Michael how straightforward it was and be using um, walls that already existed, we were fine. Yeah, well, uh, which set James is first, I'll say mine. The opening scene of this episode is actually being filmed in what is the artist's green room. So I presume they'll just have to clear out all the coffee cups and stuff. Or, or maybe they'll, no, maybe they'll add coffee cups and stains and things. So maybe that will give it a kind of Ken Loachy feel, you know. I thought they were excellent. I thought the young me was, on the day that he was shooting it, it was another pretty full on filming day. I went in over lunch and had a little chat with him. You know, I sort of said, you know, is there anything I can say to you that's going to help you with with doing Rimmer. We spoke about the character and um, and his history and things, and he explained to me how anally retentive he is. He thinks that he's he knows it all, but he often gets it wrong, and he's often the brunt of the jokes. So, you know, the, he, he helped me a lot in that. I wanted to give that sort of tweedy, old school, slightly military, slightly sort of scary, you know, your worst case uh, history master scenario. Um, to obviously intimidate the young Rimmer that has made him the man he is today. It's uh, Indiana Jones' father, I think. Um, it's very Tweedy. It's a very college lecturer. It's uh, all it lacks are the patches. Oh, no, there are patches. And in fact, my jacket was on Rimmer's dad's. If you look in the mirror, I feel a bit like Doctor Who. So, uh, yeah, if anyone's watching, that's the next plan. I took all those elements that he was trying to emulate his father that he was rather sort of booky and square and a bit geeky. And I just felt that the slightly retro, slightly 50s, really based on lovely cat, my standby, who has this really brilliant look. And I just thought that was the thing we should do. Arnold, it's me. If you're playing this message, it means you're an officer in the Space Corps. You've achieved your dreams, you're a man of significance and substance. It seems to be a direct pastiche of the Princess Leia scene um, of the little tiny Princess Leia hologram in Star Wars, um, mixed up with um, the famous Darth Vader reveal, except in our version it's, I am not your father, Rimmer. It's a nice reveal that, that gels with things we know about Rimmer. We know that Rimmer's dad hated him, we know that Rimmer's mum uh, was somebody who saw other men. So the final concluding part of that, that Rimmer's dad hated him partly because of uh, who he wasn't, which was not his child, uh, that really sort of adds up. I was absolutely dying to get it in. 
and you think, well, you, you've got these father-son things, and I was convinced, as you probably would expect, it's got to be in the Lister show too, the fathers and sons. There's got to be a double fathers and sons thing going on there. Just couldn't make it work, didn't fit, didn't do it justice, and then forgot all about it. And then suddenly it's like, ah, oh, we can put it here. It, it gives other avenues now for, for, for the Rimmer character, I think. But the idea of Rimmer being a working class hero is just not right, is it? Because he's so bloody middle class, you know, he's got all those middle class ambitions and anxieties. And it gave me the opportunity to, uh, to put a little bit of pathos, perhaps, into eventually turning it round with the hollow lamp and, and coming up with the, uh, with the plan. Action! <laughs> Hoagie's brilliant, he's brilliant. Uh, well, Richard O'Callaghan's just a f fantastic actor anyway. He originally played Hoagie in the... We had a week's rehearsal on whatever version of the script we were then doing. We didn't know who was playing that uh, at the time. Will Ferrell's name was mentioned. Anyway, so Richard came in. And we spent two or three days working, working on the scripts with Doug and uh, for him to check whether he felt these, these characters worked or, or, or not. And then I think they got tucked away in a drawer. Hoagie the Rogie got tucked away in a drawer somewhere. And then suddenly he's, he's come out again. Come on, we have you been spectacular! <laughs> There is usually a time where I feel sorrier for another performer in any one Red Dwarf series, but he really took the biscuit this time because, you know, he was covered in weird makeup, an incredibly complicated costume that was really heavy and hot, and he couldn't see. <laughs> they put these spectacles on with an eye patch over the one good eye, so I could, couldn't really see out of that one, and this huge, strange thing with beaming, uh, a laser beam in the other. The script had been kept secret for two, or was it three weeks? And the irony was, because we'd done it for the film, we had all this artwork of Hoagie. So I arrived and Howard's working off costumes and he hasn't got the right artwork. I know makeup kind of did a small freak where they didn't think they could build it in time. And Rich had word with them and said, look, Howard's done it, Howard's cool. He's done it all so quickly, why can't you? And what I love about this car is it, it just came about in about 48 hours. And it was very last minute, the makeup. It, it all happened on the Tuesday. That was the first of the three days that I came in here. They had got some ideas with big things on the helmet and various things, and the comb over was, they knew, was fairly important. But Doug, he just said, no, no, the comb over's got to be much bigger. It's got to be. So it all started all over again. Some basic components, and in fact, not that you'll ever know, but there's a bit of a Crichton groinal attachment here. And this section actually came off one of the original spacesuits from Red Dwarf oh, 3, I think. And we just added all the sort of wires and, and, and extra bits. And then to top it all, Richard had a, had a magnificent helmet with, of course, the, um, the sweep over, the toupe, which all illuminated. And he looked magnificent. And I'm really happy on um, £2.50 and um, no time. <laughs> <laughs> I do have to be led about the set, don't I? Yes, like a blind man. Yeah, I have to, I have have to, to take, take his hand like this. Ne if I'm in the next one, I'm going to ask for a, a guide dog for the blind. <laughs> <laughs> Got armor on. A few of those cans in. Yeah, Bobby. <laughs> Got armor on. So you... If we're going to recreate something like the Blue Midget that existed, then how do I do that? And if I had to stick strictly to what was already been invented, 
then I would be in a, a world of trouble trying to recreate it. In fact, then you would get into the sense of fabricating. I'd have to fabricate stuff and purpose build it. Budgets can't handle purpose building processes like that anymore. I came up with this idea that I could reinvent the drive room as a blue midget, but it did look a lot different. Now, it took us eight hours or nine hours to change that drive room into the uh, blue midget, but it took a lot longer to design it because I had to find shapes that would work or found objects that would work and, uh, and then change it primarily into a blue accent, if you like, not necessarily a blue colour. You'll see that there's columns, internal columns. As soon as you put those internal columns in place with the chrome bars on them, the walls disappear. The, the shape disappears, it comes in on you, and suddenly you're seeing a lot of depth and a foreground piece. I brought the roof down as low as I possibly could so that it would give it a cockpit feel. It would feel that almost claustrophobic quality. Normally your eye can only take in a certain amount of levels and the rest just disappears. I, I give you the top level and the top level is well dressed and then the middle level is primarily light driven and then the back level is backlit. So by the time you get that deep, um, it's all disappeared. It's all become a, an image because in the end, the only important thing is the talking head. Oh, simulant, sir. That's what you want to say. <laughs> simulant. said it takes eight hours to turn it into Blue Midget and then it will take us a day to, to reverse it. So we had to make a choice, what scenes do we want to do in front of the audience? The one drive from scene or quite a lot of the action in Blue Midget. So the decision was taken, make it Blue Midget, keep it a Blue Midget and then we'll do the drive from scene in the pickup week. Because we didn't have the set. So there was a scene that I hadn't bothered to learn because I knew we weren't doing it that night. But then Doug wanted to record a version of it to, to see where the laughs were and all that stuff. So I read it in costume in another set with my glasses on, which a lot of, <laughs> a lot of people go, Crichton should wear glasses, he looks much better. Once it was the whole might of the rogue simulant force against the might of all humanity. Now it's the whole might of the rogue simulant force against you, sir. <laughs> so, not me then. Excellent. I'll be in the rec room reading this month's copy of I'm OK magazine. Uh, uh, sir, make no mistake, we'll all be seen as Mr. Lister's lieutenants. They'll show us no mercy. Death ships are captained by special berserker generals who've been crossbred to create an insane biomechanical entity of pure evil. <laughs> And he really read it with some well, he really did, and got big laughs. Um, and so we then shot it properly and used the laughs in the same point to bridge that. That and is that the oddest experience I've ever had on it. <laughs> and we cut there. <laughs> the reference that, 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 that I had was um, from the film Dune. And we wanted some sort of um, some sort of uniform, as such. And I went for the sort of dark, uh, slightly military sort of feel that gave that sort of dictator look. It had this slightly sort of uh, future Elizabethan sort of look about it. Doug told me the Death Ship was a candelabra, dark, apocalyptic space. The walls around it that you are hard to define, but they're there. Are all walls from? the India and the Trojan, um, the existing in their space that I just painted everything black and then worked from there up. Then put the lighting concepts of, of small digital lights around things to make them give, give all the candles a sense of being elevated or suspended in mid-air in some cases. I'm Alex Hardy and I'm playing Chancellor Wednesday and this is Baxter, the evil, the evil dog. Ooh, I am the dominator. Our relationship's quite uneasy, I think. I think there's some kind of, like, homoerotic stuff going on there. I'm not sure if he'd say the same thing, that's why I'm playing it, anyway. I think that because they're half robot and half human, what's funny to play is that very robo robotic um, standard villain, but sometimes the human emotions take over and he just wants them to say sorry. Or, <laughs> or uh, at the same time, he's quite capable of saying, take him away. Kill him. The Dominator Gary Cady, who was scary. And we did the whole sequence, the whole Harry Carry thing. And then we walked off for a tea break. 
and Gary said to me, is this a comedy? And I went, yeah. He said, all right. right. And, <laughs> and he's picking up sausages. This guy looks important. OK. You know what you must do. So is the props, isn't it, that get in the way? I thought I was bloody brilliant at that. It's a silly business. You spend, like, uh, half an hour sliding a sword across the table so that it would hit exactly the right point for the camera. Yeah, I mean, that's unusual for Red Dwarf to have scenes where none of us are in them. Yeah, I know, that was the crazy thing, that these guys are all on their own being funny and not a Red Dwarf are in sight. And uh, we never really got to interact with them at all. They were in, off on one room on their own sort of thing, and we were in another room trying to get our shit together. Once they'd finished, we all met round the back, like old thesps. <laughs> Darling, you were marvellous! Well, the first thing we saw of it was uh, when it was played in, in front of the audience, and it was funny. I mean, all that, all of that Harry Carey stuff, funny stuff. Alex Hardy, we'd work with on Over to Bill. I think he's just brilliant. And he didn't let me down. I just think that Harry Carey scene's just... I just think he's sensational, in it? Oh, that was quite... Yeah, the guts were quite disgusting. The guts were actually... I don't know if you could tell this, cos they were very, very, very realistic. They were sausages covered in chilli relish and HP sauce. And I've got to be honest with you, before I started this, I really liked chilli relish and HP sauce, and now the stink of that stuff I don't think I can ever eat it again. But yeah, just had to do a bit of acting with some sausages. If we get this wrong, we should all burn our equity cards. There's a boarding party at the Cargo Bay. There's a boarding party. Because I think these two should be swapped. Oh, well, let's get you. Mr. Blue Meat. Let's try again. Let's back it up a little bit further. Yeah, we've got some burning equity cards around here already. We always knew the pick-up week was going to be... Um, what is the phrase? A bit of a bastard. Um, <laughs> I guess it's a blue midget, it's a CB3. But it's only in mid-service. Final week was... It was pretty tough for everyone. I can't wear a mask for more than two days in a row. In that sense, I had, I had days off. But, um, you know, the days that I was on... <laughs> not, I wasn't sitting around in deck chairs telling anecdotes. It gets difficult with the cat because then there's always a full costume change. Craig might have to put on a backpack or something, but I have to do the whole change. You know, that means trousers, shirt, tie, pins, earrings, bracelets, rings, everything has to get changed, and then, you know, you're under pressure anyway, then you've got to take, you know, 10 minutes to go and get changed, and by that time you come back and you think, what am I saying again? Then it's like, oh, do you remember that bit in episode two? And it's like, no. <laughs> do you remember that bit in episode two? Not really. <laughs> you know, and then it's like, you know, relearning stuff that you've learned and then cast off. And the last day in particular, the, the list on the schedule was so incredibly long, all the things we needed to pick up, that it was just manic, absolutely manic. I and mean, we did it an enormous amount. I can't believe how much we did that day. Look out! Three, two, one, oh. Three, two, one, oh. Lots of finicky bits, you know, over-the-shoulder shots there, bits on green screen, close-ups of feet or boots or hands or pressing things, that kind of stuff. So, you know, it just... it's... it's tiresome. Come on, ladies and gentlemen, for pretty much the very last time on Red Dwarf Series 10, that's a wrap! <laughs> Pinocchio strikes again. <laughs> hey! Uh, have you got cups there, Sean? Thanks, man. Great job. Hang on a sec. Well done to you. Are you still filming? Oh, shit. <laughs> <laughs> Do you want to cover them with body bags? No, no, no. <laughs>
the whole post-production thing was just, well, it was a roller coaster where you were just going down basically all the time, where it was just one thing after the other. The miniature shoots a disaster. We may not have a broadcastable series, just on and on and on. Then Rupesh came along. He originally was working on the DVD value added stuff, but came across to the main shoot as line producer and wound up as production executive in charge of the production. I was coming in every morning to go, let's see what this throws up today. Uh, because every day there was a, a new technical issue or a, or a financial issue or a logistical issue. And that became the issue of the day. A DIT is a um, well, digital imaging technician. You need him. You need a DIT when you do a, sh a shoot on, on on HD cameras. You know, with with especially with the reds with the size of the files, they're huge, and it's a lot. Of, it's a big. You know, it's not an easy workflow. DIT is your insurance guy. It's like owning a house and not having the house insured. Having lots of things would have greatly helped us, um, but in the end, you've only got so much money, and it stretches to where it stretches. One day, Nick Ames says. I'm noticing this weird, just slightly weird thit patterning on the left-hand corner of the, of, 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 the, of the moose scene in the drive room between Cat and Lister in show one. 24 hours later, get a phone call back saying this footage as it currently stands will fail QC. Oh, it's failed QC again somewhere else. Whoops. What that means is you cannot broadcast this on television. I think it's one of those things where you've been looking at something so long that you suddenly find certain things with it, then everyone runs around going, yes, there's something there, there's something there. It seemed at one point the only solution was that we could spend roughly between 40 to 50,000 pounds per frame to correct it at a lab in Los Angeles, which was just phenomenal. At that point, you might as well just reshoot the whole of the series. We'd already lost the sets, the actors had gone, Danny was in Guadeloupe, it was a total nightmare. And it was through um, further tests, further correction, further grading uh, here in the UK, um, just pulling in as many favours as we could, um, we ended up getting the image to, to the standard we needed it, and it passed QC. But this process went on for about a good six and a half weeks, which meant for six and a half weeks we were working on a show which we had no idea whether or not it would pass QC and whether or not we could transmit it. But if you look in the left-hand corner of Danny's face, <laughs> You should see some patterning. <laughs> we were looking at the first model shots and wondering how to get them full screen. And I think Rich said they might not have been transcoded properly. And so we realised that we would need to have the backup hard drives to do this test. Only that opened up a whole new um, you know, minefield, because at this point, no one knew where the rushes were. And then we suddenly realised that in fact, there was only one set of hard drives in existence. The only company who does have a set of rushes is the Post House doing our VFX. We were based out in Soho, which now means there is only one set of rushes available for the entire production. And if anything was to happen to those rushes, we don't have a production. The last person to see the rushes was David Mason, our line producer, who'd kept them in his office for safekeeping. <laughs> but by this point, David had left the production and was in America. A few frantic emails and phone calls later, we tracked David down, and he said maybe the delivery driver had got the boxes mixed up when David cleared his office, and instead of delivering the rushes to Grand the Productions, as David had asked him to, maybe the driver had delivered all the drives to David's lockup by mistake. But no one could be sure until David uh, got back from the States. In the meantime, all the VisFX work stopped on the other set of rushes, um, and we waited for David to get back to the UK to see if his theory was right. A couple of days later, David arrived with some hard drive boxes and went, here they are. At which point we have to go through a whole bunch of you know, technical assessment of these rushes, because we don't know what conditions they've been kept in. We have the now clip test, 17 hard drives, uh, and all of this costs a, a huge amount of money. In the end, when you've got so many things going wrong on a daily basis, the only thing you can do is laugh. And I think, looking back, um, Red Wolf 10 was probably the funniest show I ever worked on. In terms of production successes, what are the things you are proudest of? Um, as a producer, you're not particularly the person who goes, I'm proud of something. I think the decision that worked best for everyone, even though it was a nightmare and had enormous budgetary um, consequences, was doing it in front of an audience. <laughs> I was mopping for weeks, sir. <laughs> <laughs> Fantastic. Really, really, really good. <laughs>
think that after so many episodes and so many years that it's just still the very best, you know, comedy on the television. Yeah, no, brilliant. It's brilliant. It's a really good experience. I even got to see Jesus. That was how epic it was. Massive, massive fan, and I'm just thrilled to be here. Loved every minute of it. And all I can say is the boys from the Dwarf are back. Just like we got out of that thing with a highly corrosive microorganism. Once again, Big Arm saves the day. Oh, please, sir, can we sort this out once and for all? Just because you happen to... kids, my brother. <laughs> yeah, that was a definitely a late amendment to the script. That, that, that Doug really wanted to get that in, that it was important to kind of give a, give a sort of... It was sort of throwing a line to the people going, well, what happened at the end of Series 8? And it sort of goes, well, this happened, sort of. <laughs> That's really cruel. Yeah, but it was such a tease because we never get round to spinning the beans. Never. I, 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 I want to call this Red Dwarf 10, The Search Red Dwarf 9. You know, I just think it'd be a great title for it, you know, because then it... It gets them more worked up. What did happen? What did happen at the end of it? Well, how did they get out of that jam? Lots of fans were asking, um, and, but we didn't want to start with a, an exposition heavy show one, uh, and then we thought we'd deal with it later and later and later. And we suddenly got to show six, um, and there wasn't really a proper time to deal with it. Um, so we did it, first of all, just as a one off joke, and then we thought, actually, we can do that as a tag. So we did it as a tag. Um, but if it really drives people crazy, it's not a fantastically interesting story. Uh, but basically, what happened at the end of Series 8 was...